Three letters which were the heartbeat of many wrestling fans, a brand which defined a generation with some of the best stories, matches, and moments in recent WWE history, a brand that reignited a love of professional wrestling for many. NXT was the lifeblood for so many professional wrestling fans in North America. It had humble beginnings as a developmental, but the brand quickly trended upwards and it never looked back. See, NXT focused on the introduction of new talent and telling simple stories. The brand had a focus on giving the fans the matches that they wanted to see. This was for the hardcore viewer who wanted to see what was up and coming, who knew about wrestling outside of the WWE, and slowly NXT became the ultimate collection of outsider talent. On the main roster, you'd get a ton of shenanigans and it would leave fans oftentimes really frustrated and quite disengaged on the outcomes, but NXT focused on the second W in the WWE, and that was wrestling. Their stories were presented with the fat cutoff and with a defined start and end point, and that end point was usually at NXT TakeOver. These were some of the most fun wrestling shows on the planet, with electric crowds, jaw-dropping matches, and debuts aplenty. From 2012 to 2021, NXT was known as the black and gold brand. It spent most of its time on the WWE Network as a one-hour show. It was easy to digest, and it became a close community. The booking decisions made sense. They didn't try to wow you with something. The right decision oftentimes was made. The stories were good, and they were able to build from within. It gained a cult following, and slowly started to make more and more noise around the world. Soon it turned into a super indie and the wrestling promotion in North America, not just for fans, but as the landing spot for top names as well. People who were well-traveled, stars from TNA's glory days, and even people from overseas, NXT became the spot to sign. Triple H's vision was received well by many, and the brand became something unforgettable, undeniable, and unbeatable. It's hard to believe that a developmental, a farm system, turned into something so big that it went from Orlando to London to Japan to Toronto. NXT simply took over. It felt like a love letter to professional wrestling, a passion project in which the writers strived for excellence with the viewer in mind, and the motive wasn't profit. It was creating something that wrestling fans could always rely on, something that rewarded you for being a fan, and something that you could call your own. They built a roster filled with fan favorites. Favorites. They developed a catalog of matches and had a rise that will forever stand the test of time. Let's go back and take a look at the 9 years of NXT Black and Gold. NXT originally began as a game show in 2010 in which talent would compete in ridiculous challenges and it was a device to determine who would get a WWE contract through an elimination based format even though most of the wrestlers were already contracted under Florida Championship Wrestling. After a few iterations and moderate success, the NXT brand was rebranded into WWE Developmental. FCW was no more, but the crew and wrestlers moved over. WWE decided to go from this dingy old warehouse to Full Sail University, the place that would become the canvas for what NXT was about to paint over the next near decade. The production value was increased, the show was now altered to give competitors more exposure, Many talents went back to the drawing board and rejuvenated themselves from their presentations to their characters. And then on June 20th, 2012, the first episode of this new NXT aired. It was called The Gateway to the Future, and the future, according to the WWE, was now. Almost all the FCW talents made their way to this new brand. It had its own distinct look with a big, bold black and yellow logo. The arena only fit 400, which gave it a community feeling as many people would see each other during tapings and become good friends. Dusty Rhodes was the on-screen general manager as well as a mentor to talent behind the scenes. He was the guy who helped make these stars the best version of themselves. He truly helped them establish the why. Why were they in pro wrestling? And when Dusty worked with these people, it came to the forefront on TV. And of course, they had their own cast of characters. The push early on was to showcase young talent with distinct looks. Guys like Bo Dallas, The Ascension, Bray Wyatt, Leo Kruger, Paige, Mike Dalton, Biggie Langston, and Seth Rollins. The same Seth Rollins who would become the first ever NXT champion. In August of 2012, the Gold Rush Tournament was announced. This was an eight-man single elimination tournament to crown NXT's first ever champion. Seth Rollins etched his name in history, and he, as well as the brand, never looked back. 
One of the real gems in WWE's developmental system was Rollins, so it only made sense for him to be the first. You saw a woman get more TV time and be treated as an important factor of the show. They weren't relegated to two minute matches, they could build their characters and have original stories which lasted multiple weeks with reasonable payoffs. The first true woman star for NXT was Paige. Her character was the anti-diva, rebelling against all the norms of the typical WWE divas wrestler you'd see on Raw or SmackDown. A year after NXT's relaunch, the NXT Women's Championship was announced, and this one was also contested for in a tournament. Paige ended up being the winner. NXT at this time only had singles titles until Shawn Michaels introduced the brand new NXT Tag Team Championships. Tag Team Wrestling would become a staple of NXT. A wide variety of teams went through there and the matches and storylines were sometimes better than what was happening in the main event. The team of Oliver Gray and Neville became the first ever NXT Tag Team Champions when they beat the Wyatt family. Neville would eventually win over audiences with his aerial offense following the team splitting and he became one of NXT's most early success stories. There wasn't anything too crazy when it came to storylines or deep-rooted feuds early on. As someone who rewatched every single episode, it was a lot of nothing for the most part, but we're still early on. We start to see graduates of NXT succeed on the main roster almost immediately. The first success story was The Shield. They pulled double duty alternating between shows following their debut in late 2012. In 2012 and 2013, there was a huge connection to the main roster. Talents would come down to work with the next generation. The show would see the Intercontinental and US Championship defended on it. People like Randy Orton, Cesaro, CM Punk, AJ Lee among others rocked up and it really gave the brand some more buzz and credibility. Very much so, this whole operation was still a developmental. In July of 2013, Charlotte debuted in NXT alongside Ric Flair. It's almost fitting that her first opponent on weekly TV was Bayley because of what they'd eventually morph into. These were two fourths of the group that would go on to be known as the Four Horsewomen. You're always told that these four are really important but never the why, and the why is actually pretty simple. Basically in a smaller scale, they were what the Smackdown 6 were to Smackdown. They were the ones who everything went through one way or another, everything revolved around these four. Tag team rivalries, one on one rivalries, championship matches, betrayals, you name it, it was up to these four. The first person who debuted out of these four was Sasha and it took her about a year to really differentiate herself but once she found her stride, she rode a wave of momentum and she never looked back. Bailey was a shy fangirl who slowly gained confidence and won over the fans. Becky Lynch came later on and had a generic Irish gimmick which she'd come out doing an Irish jig. Thankfully it only lasted a few weeks. But she was the last one to make her debut compared to the other three. But through the creative team's writing, they were able to get her on par with the rest of them. Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks, Charlotte, and Bayley were instrumental to the rise of NXT and the re-rise of women's wrestling. Yes, I said re-rise because despite what WWE might tell you, there was an amazing women's division before these four. They just killed it off themselves and they don't want to admit it. With them, there were also other women's competitors important to NXT's early years like Summer Rae, Emma, Audrey Marie who very few of you know. The big development by the end of 2013 was the women's division and the tag team division. But also in 2013 came NXT's first big star and I'm not talking Rollins, I'm not talking Big E, Bo Dallas or even Paige. This is the man who helped the brand take off and I think a lot of people have forgotten just how much he contributed to the online craze of NXT. NXT's first sentimental star that bled black and yellow. That man is Sami Zayn. In January of 2013, he signed with the company. He came in with a global resume as El Generico. He alongside Cesaro sent shockwaves online with their matches. And the whole underdog story of Sami Zayn honestly is a video of its own, but they played the long game with him and it worked. Cesaro and Sami had a 2 out of 3 falls match which was fantastic. They got people talking about their chemistry and how this amazing match was taking place on a developmental show. As we now know, the 2 out of 3 falls match would become the NXT special in years to come. When he got his crowning moment, it felt like the whole world was behind Sammy. They told this deep rooted story of Sammy where he'd face his personal demons, his friends, and most importantly himself. He overcame all, he got his moment, and then at that exact moment, his best friend stabbed him in the back on his biggest date. That was actually in 2014, and 2014 is where I'd say NXT had their breakout year. See, 2012 and 2013 were instrumental in terms of building, introduction to different faces, bringing in titles, slowly fleshing everything out. 
but 2014 proved that NXT was a different animal and that they were here to stay. William Regal became the new on-screen general manager. He'd wrestled, he'd been a pro, he'd compensated, he'd done everything for the brand, and now he was the authority figure. William Regal became synonymous with the NXT brand and playing maybe the most perfect and unbiased authority figure in company history. We all remember the classic Regal announcement. It felt like every time he had something to say, he'd announce some big match, championship, or signing. And signings are exactly what we gotta talk about. In the summer of 2014, WWE signed Japanese superstar Kenta to an NXT contract. The brand was now looking to build their roster and add depth to it. His first storyline was against the now titleless Ascension. They had their 343 day tag team title reign ended by the Lucha Dragons and that record still holds up as the longest NXT tag team title reign. He was getting dominated 2 on 1 so he said he was going to bring out a tag team partner. And this partner wasn't just anyone, this was one of the biggest wrestling superstars on the planet. Fergal Devitt, the man we know today as Finn Balor, was in NXT. Sammy can be attributed as NXT's first big sentimental star. But the signing of Finn Balor was a look at things to come. He quickly rose up the ranks and became a fan favorite. Also, the signing of Kevin Steen, which made an immediate impact. They were big game hunting on free agents and it was working for them. As one chapter closed for this brand and 2014 drew to a close, their biggest and most prominent chapter begun. NXT started touring, they started doing smaller scale shows in Cleveland, in Columbus, in San Jose and the turnout for those shows were something that you wouldn't expect at various festivals and conventions. Leaving Orlando was a really good decision for NXT. In June of 2015, Dusty Rhodes unfortunately passed away. The man who was a mentor and integral in the building of the brand was now gone. They memorialized his passing with an annual tag team tournament called the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. On a more positive note, in online circles and among WWE fans, WWE NXT had picked up big time credibility. It was one hour on the WWE Network which launched a year previous. The stories were simple and easy to follow without the clutter attached to them. The characters were different to what you would see on Raw and SmackDown. And in this Vince McMahon industry where he for sure had a particular type and way of looking at things, NXT just let people be people. NXT looked to the indies, they looked to other companies, even overseas. They wanted to diversify their roster. On September 16, 2015, a vignette aired of this woman with colored hair in a mask. Come to find out that her name was Asuka. Kana was now in the WWE. NXT was legitimately the place to be. Another year, another step forward. That was a step forward. 2016 became an astronomical leap. William Regal announced that a brand new talent would be making their debut in late February of 2016. And the person NXT had signed was Austin Aries. WWE was replenishing talent right as they left. And this is kind of where a problem began that instead of building for the main roster, they started to build for NXT. On the flip side, Sammy had injured his shoulder against John Cena when he went up for a one-off match on Raw, and he was back looking for the NXT title now held by Finn Balor. I kid you not, there was an NXT episode where Sami Zayn and Samoa Joe fought for almost the entire episode. At the end of it, Joe became the number one contender, so the question was what was next for Sammy? The next week, Regal announced that at TakeOver Dallas, a night before WrestleMania 32, he was going to face NXT's newest signing. Not Austin Aries, but Shinsuke Nakamura. One of New Japan Pro Wrestling's most awe-inspiring and charismatic stars. The match at TakeOver Dallas, you can call it a lot of things. Exhilarating, perfect, jaw-dropping, legendary. But you could call it as the moment where NXT had truly stamped their arrival. Stars like Samoa Joe, Finn Balor, Nakamura, the newly signed Bobby Roode, Asuka, and the iconic rivalry of DIY and The Revival continued to bring the NXT name forward. They continued to add big names from varying backgrounds as well as their own success stories from the Performance Center like Velveteen and Bianca. In March of 2017, a vignette ran of candles and darkness and the question was, who was this gonna be? It could have been Triple H himself because this man is obsessed with this type of stuff. But this man's name ended up being Aleister Black. WWE had signed Tommy End from the Indies and here's where the pace of the signings picked up and they decided to sign everyone under the sun. On June 28th, 2017, Moro Ronaldo was added to the commentary team. He'd for many become the iconic voice of NXT with pop culture one-liners and over-the-top commentary presence. His voice simply became iconic for the black and gold brand. 
We started to see a ton of UK talent incorporated into NXT's weekly shows. Names like Tyler Bate, Pete Dunne, Trent Seven. NXT's cleanup of the independent scene was in full effect. They were building a roster for the ages. They became the ultimate indie themselves. If PWG, ROH, and New Japan had a baby, it would probably be NXT. We also had the return of Drew McIntyre who had some huge expectations on his shoulders the first time around. He left, rebuilt himself, and now he was on his redemption tour. He did that, he beat Bobby Roode to become the new NXT champion, and following that, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish appeared on the ring apron. Another well-known team by the name of Red Dragon. And at that same moment, from the crowd emerged Adam Cole. Adam Cole was a huge name on the independent circuit, and WWE signing him was literally them signing their poster boy. Mauro Ronaldo said it was a seismic shift in the NXT landscape, and it was just that. The formation of the Undisputed Era, there's just something about the group which became synonymous with NXT. It's fitting that that was the group whose main colors were black and yellow, and they defined this brand at their peak. They became staples of that show. They also became the reason why War Games was revived and brought back to the WWE. In the coming years of 2018, 19, and 20, NXT would see its biggest growth period as the buzz became paramount, the roster became stacked, and the intricacies of stories grew larger and larger. NXT was no longer this little project out of full sale. It had grown. They were running venues just as big as the WWE with more engaged crowds, better matches, and signings galore. Fans became elated with the product, and it was almost satisfying to know that whatever might be happening elsewhere, NXT was always reliable. NXT always had your back. People were excited of this next generation for the WWE, and the fantasy bookings I remember them, they were off the chain. The brand grew in roster size, in championship size, and in popularity. People were waving the NXT flag high, and many people were proud to follow the WWE again. And that's no exaggeration, the height NXT had reached by the time TakeOver New Orleans came was astronomical. They were through the roof, they had talent, they had the matches, they had the stories, they were the quintessential wrestling product. So astronomical that by 2019, what was once a developmental made its way to national television. They had a rich roster of talent. Guys like Finn Balor, Johnny Gargano, Tommaso Ciampa, Cole, Shirai, Ripley. The list goes on. NXT was not your kind and it was taking the industry by storm. But you may have noticed that I've glossed over one very important thing. On the January 15th, 2014 episode of NXT, Triple H made a huge announcement that would change the brand. He announced the first ever NXT special. It wasn't a takeover that came later on. This was called NXT Arrival. The WWE Network had launched on February 24th and the big selling point was all the exclusive WWE contacts. One of those was a glimpse into the future with NXT. This was going to be the first live special in the network's existence. NXT arrival began with Cesaro and Sami Zayn. Before these two even touched, the crowd was chanting match of the year. Both guys having each other scouted for the fourth time in NXT delivered a thriller of a match. Too Cool rocked up on this show for some reason. Paige and Emma had a rematch of their tournament finals. And to cap off the night, Neville and Bo Dallas had NXT's first ever ladder match with Neville becoming the new NXT champion. Later in the year, it was WrestleMania season, and for Paige, she went up to the main roster and beat AJ on her very first night, making her both Divas and NXT Women's Champion. We'd seen a lot of stars go up and succeed by this point. Big E, Rollins, Reigns, the Wyatts, and so with everyone going up and NXT call-ups literally taking over the main roster, a new creation was announced. Triple H announced the very first NXT TakeOver set for May of 2014. We all know that TakeOvers would eventually become a two, maybe three hour show jam packed with some of the best in-ring action in North American professional wrestling. But it had very humble beginnings. NXT TakeOver came to us on May 29th, 2014 from Full Sail University. The first ever TakeOver match was Camacho versus Adam Rose. Strange, but even they didn't know what was about to come. Charlotte became the new NXT Women's Champion beating Natalia in the Battle of Generations following Paige being stripped of the NXT title. The TakeOver brand would become unmissable for many fans. You knew what you were in for, you don't need me to tell you how good they were. We'll come back and take a look at TakeOvers later on in the video. 
But TakeOver wasn't just the name of their network specials, they were taking over literally in the eyes of fans, in the hearts of many, and in the minds of a lot of talent. Many wrestlers made NXT their premier landing spot. NXT was becoming comparable to that of a super team. Everybody wanted to sign there. So with all these signings, let's meet our cast of characters. Early on, there was a bigger emphasis on characters having a distinguished trait to set them apart. As time grew on, this is meant in a nice way, the focus became on more simple characters who were proficient in the ring with some exceptions. Early on, we saw Big E who'd come out with his 5 count and I can't keep still as his theme. His charisma and look had fans drooling over what was going to come in his future. Bo Dallas was a chicken shit heel where the crowd would literally turn their back on him and he's just like, no, it's cause I'm good, they love me, they're both leaving. Paige was the anti-diva, the shield as the hounds of justice appeared quite a few times on NXT even though they were on the main roster. Roman Reigns was low-key Santos Escobar before Escobar was in the WWE. He would come out wearing suits, he was rejecting interviews, telling everyone that he was going to do things on his time. Little did we know he would go on to become the final boss regardless. But there's some forgotten ones as well. CJ Parker literally had the recycling gimmick before Daniel Bryan did. Cassius Ono had some of the most consistent stories on the brand, especially in the early days and would later return to the brand at its height. He was the guy who you could throw in with anyone and he'd be just fine. There were also people who took a while to find their footing. Alexa Bliss, Angelo Dawkins, the character of the lone wolf Baron Corbin, that's one that took some time to flesh out. And now we get to the big ones. Sami Zayn, the perfect underdog. He could wrestle, he could tell a story with his expressions, and he could get everyone behind him. Without him, NXT does not become as popular as it did. That man bled those colors for three years. I'm sure many who have fond memories of NXT probably first think of Finn Balor. When the former Bullet Club leader arrived, he generated a ton of buzz for NXT, but once he introduced NXT fans to the demon persona, he became one of the most popular characters in the WWE full stop. Doesn't matter, Raw, Smackdown, he was right up there. I remember he was on all types of branding. He was on posters, he was in games. People were loving this persona. One side human, the other side demon. The ability to dig down deep and get what you want. Finn was one of few people to have two runs in NXT, and the second time round, he didn't have the demon persona. I'd even go to say that it was a better run than the first. His matches were better because of what NXT had become. His character work was simple and effective as kind of this old guard among the new class. Bobby Roode, a guy who was all class made grand entrances, enjoyed the lavish lifestyle dressing in expensive suits reminiscent of the 80s horsemen. Shinsuke Nakamura brought the charisma and big feel to every arena he competed in. Maybe to this day the biggest signing in NXT history. The only man who can oppose him in my opinion is Adam Cole and the Undisputed Era. Four guys who had been friends before they came to the WWE and when they were all put together it was something special. They tried so hard to be heels, but you just couldn't hate these guys. Adam Cole was the cocky and cheeky leader who'd do anything to win. Kyle brought the comedic value and is a fantastic wrestler in his own right. Roderick Strong was the Iron Man and could go deep into a match with literally anyone. And Bobby Fish, um, you know, he was there too. No, but jokes aside, without him, it just doesn't feel the same. I gotta talk about Adam Cole a little. From 2017 to 2021, he was in NXT and his run was something to marvel at. The way Triple H was able to present him and then Cole taking that presentation further was something extremely well done. When the move happened to USA and he was champion, he carried that brand. From 2019 to 2020 when he held the NXT title, he was probably a top 5 wrestler on the planet. In 2019, this dude wrestled everywhere. Raw, SmackDown, NXT, Evolve. In 2019 also came his big trilogy against Johnny Gargano. Underdogs in the WWE, Eddie, Ray, Brian, Jeff. For NXT, he was that guy. Undersized and sometimes overlooked. Every time Johnny went out there, he gave you a performance you would remember. Didn't matter if it was a 7 minute match, didn't matter if it was a 27 minute match. His offense and way of wrestling from behind made him a fan favorite. At takeovers, Gargano would oftentimes lose but have the best performance, giving him the name of Johnny Takeover. You knew every time it was a takeover and Gargano went out there that he was going to do something nuts. 
that it was probably going to be the match of the night, basically what HBK was at WrestleMania. The story that really made him though was against the man who we can possibly call the greatest NXT champion of all time, and that is Tommaso Ciampa. Who would have thought in 2015 that this guy on your screen, look at him, this guy right here, would have one of the most compelling character arcs in NXT history. He turned on Gargano in 2017 and legitimately became one of the most hated people on the roster. If there was ever a textbook heel, it was Champa. He'd come out, no music, slow walk, and people would literally chant, fuck you Champa. They wanted this man's head on a silver platter after what he did to Gargano. Became the NXT champion, started calling it Goldie, did some fantastic character work, but just a few years later, he became one of the most loved guys on that roster because of an injury he had sustained and what he represented. He represented the rise of NXT, how basically anyone, doesn't matter if you're a tag team guy, doesn't matter if you're someone from the PC, if you put in the work, you can become a top star. Tyler Breeze is another guy in here who's forgotten and looking back at his run probably should have been NXT champion or at worst won the North American title in his second time around. His character was all flamboyance. Can't say flamboyance without the Velveteen Dream. It really is a sad case, but he's maybe the best pure character in NXT black and gold history. At a very young age, he had all the earmarkings of the next one. He had a very quick rise where he won over fans by simply just being different. He stood out, he made this sexually ambiguous character stick. And I kid you not, people were laughing in the crowd when he made his debut, but he was able to make those same people who were laughing at him cheer for him. And the man he made it really work with was Aleister Black. This is a Triple H operation, of course you need that one guy who's all spooky and pissed off at the world, and that was Aleister Black. Many had him slotted in as the new mystical dark character in the WWE. And then we come to Samoa Joe, who was William Regal's biggest nightmare. This man beefed everyone he possibly could we already know how insane he was in tna but when he came to nxt this dude was a menace he could talk he could wrestle and he'd do everything in his power to leave carnage at the nxt arena regal wants me to sign a contract nah i'm gonna set up my own table and make him bring the contract to me Regal won't bring me Nakamura, alright, I'm just gonna make sure that he has no talent to put into matches and destroy literally everyone making an entrance. Similar to him was Kevin Owens, this psychopath was the most ruthless man you have ever seen. I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about Ricochet. Ricochet brought a high flying offense to NXT, he was able to do things that did not seem humanly possible. Man would jump, rebound, bounce, hop, off, anything you could imagine. Andrade Cien Almas had a fun in-ring style when he aligned with Zelina Vega. He went from being a Casanova to being one of the biggest stars NXT had. Drew McIntyre had a very short run but had a newly found creative genius behind him also winning the NXT title. Ty Dillinger with his 10 chance maybe ruined the life of a referee forever. He was also a pretty popular star during those rising years for NXT. There's so many more guys, Matt Riddle, Keith Lee, Pete Dunne who was an underappreciated MVP of NXT, Dominic Dijakovic, Hideo Itami, the cruiserweights later on with Garza, Rush, and Swerve, Legado del Fantasma, Cross, McAfee was really good. Those guys, great, but how about the women? Like I mentioned, time, effort, and respect was given to the women of NXT, and the collection that has gone through there is a chef's kiss. Early on, it was the paid show. Then it went to the Four Horsewomen era, which we've already talked about. That era, to be quite honest, was fun and it was really integral in building NXT. But once they left and NXT had to build up new people, man, this became a different level of special. The woman who took the NXT women's title off Bayley was Asuka. She was presented as a tactical genius who would do anything to win and whose strength no one could overcome. No one could beat her. Her look was unique from the colored hair to the different ring gear. She was presented as the most unconquerable force in NXT's women's division, even more so than the men. She held on to the NXT women's title for 522 days without eating a pin or submission. So much so that she went to the main roster undefeated, vacated that title, and it was won by Ember Moon. 
Ember Moon was made to look big time. One of the patterns you saw with NXT women were long reigns in which they'd build up others by having them face the champion, and the champion almost never lost. This was the case for Ember. Her eclipse was presented as the deadliest thing since Draymond. As time wore on, NXT looked elsewhere for signings, and the division grew, and just like the men, it became embarrassingly good. You saw the debut of Dakota Kai, Kyrie Sane following the Mae Young Classic, Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, Shayna Baszler just ripped through everyone until she quite literally met Rhea Ripley. And then the reign that felt like the last NXT Women's title reign in the black and gold era. And that one was of Io Shirai. First she came out with this babyface presentation, but once this woman took out Candice LeRae, it was wrapped. She came out wearing all black, the presentation was different, the music hit hard. Her style in ring, we may not see it to this degree on the main roster, but on NXT, this was possibly the greatest run of matches by a women's champion we've seen in today's day and age in the WWE. Bianca Belair did really well for herself on NXT building from the ground up. How could we forget Alexa Bliss? And then there were also those women who were just solid for what they were. You asked them to do anything and they could. Mia Yim, Tegan Knox, Kaylee Ray, Tony Storm, the forgotten but really good run of Nikki Cross in NXT out here trying to kill Asuka for some reason. And lastly in this section, I gotta touch on something that the brand excelled at and I'd be remiss not to talk about. Tag Team Wrestling. In NXT, ever since the tag team titles were introduced in 2013, they didn't look back. What they were able to do with the tag team division was let people find their footing, screw up, look around, and sometimes these teams just fell into place. It's almost like they were meant to be. Like, Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins took four years to find each other. Dash and Dawson weren't even the original revival. The Ascension had a completely different version to start off. And Blake and Murphy were just something that fell into place and found Alexa Bliss. The Wyatts were dominant, three big bearded dudes whose sole purpose was to create destruction and pain. After them was the Lucha Dragons, two, well, one amazing high-flying luchador. The dynamic worked perfectly. The Vaudevillains was a gimmick-heavy team which really exploded in popularity in 2015. American Alpha were two guys who actually weren't even intended to be a team. The story was that Gable wanted to team with Jordan, but Jordan kept blowing him off. This was eventually going to transition into a feud, but these two were two superior wrestlers who could go in the ring with anyone, and when they came together, it led to in-ring magic. These teams revitalized tag team wrestling in the WWE, and NXT cared about it a ton. There isn't a single year where you look back and you don't see some amazing teams, but it was the team of Dash and Dawson that were really the flag bearers of that division. Once they came together and they started climbing their way up, that tag division, it's almost like Triple H looked at it and went, wow, this is insane. I have to maintain this and I can't let this go. We don't have time to get into every single tag team, I'll quickly rifle some more off. Imperium, GYV, War Raiders, Mustache Mountain, DIY, AOP, Undisputed Era, duh, Legado del Fantasma, MSK, Sanity. It's insane how much talent this brand saw in just nine years. What's a wrestling show without rivalries? NXTs were something special and different. Oftentimes, what would happen was we'd get the gradual introduction of a character who'd work their way up and eventually they'd become a star. Even their big independent signings would be slowly massaged into the product. Some stories were simple, some were deep rooted, and some were slow burners which took years to complete. I already talked about Sami Zayn and Cesaro which really kicked off the storytelling aspect. Then came Owens and Zayn. It was simple and to the point and it made Kevin Owens immediately by having him presented as a killer and continuing the generico Steen rivalry on NXT. Then it moved over to Finn versus Owens which was the ruthless nature of Kevin Owens against the smarts and wittiness of Finn Balor. At the same time, we had the rivalry of Bayley and Sasha Banks. 
This was the story of the opposition of confidence, believing in yourself and slowly burning to a win. One woman was confident in her abilities while the other one was shy and unsure of herself and she had been turned on by all of her friends. She slowly built up a mean streak and she won the big one. Speaking of the big one, Gargano vs Ciampa. This is the one whether you like it or not. This is the rivalry that had the most intricacies and deep rooted story inside of it. I know a lot of people soured on it because it became NXT's go to feud in the later years, but this story is probably the best one that NXT has ever told. Ciampa and Gargano walked into the Dusty Cup in 2015 without a contract. They were paired together and they became really good friends. Fast forward and by the end of 2016, they'd worked their way up and became one of the most beloved tag teams on NXT. They chased the tag team titles, but they couldn't get it done. They came so close, but the Revival just kept beating them. The Revival kept denying them at every turn until finally at TakeOver Toronto, DIY in an amazing 2 out of 3 falls match won the big one. They held the titles for a bit until they lost them to the Authors of Pain. And then they had try after try after try. Gargano even took the fall for his friend, but at the end of TakeOver Chicago, when that corner bug came up, there was still something left to go. Champa turned on Gargano and everyone was heartbroken. These two would go on to define the rest of NXT through a blood feud in which can only be comparable to that of Shawn Michaels and Triple H in a much lesser scale. I'm not comparing those two to these two in terms of character and overall legacy, but the feud was pretty similar. Ciampa was a complete psychopath. He was targeting Gargano's marriage, costing him his job time and time again, making him leave on a stretcher. They headlined takeover after takeover, and this was the perfect way to build a tag team into main eventers for the future. Another one of these standout rivalries was Velveteen Dream vs Aleister Black, and this may seem ridiculous on the surface to people who didn't watch NXT, but it was really enjoyable. The whole premise was Velveteen Dream was a provocative sexual character, and Aleister Black was a quiet, soft spoken, and broken individual. At this time, Black was dominating everyone and he ran through everyone in record time. He was going to speak for the first time in NXT, but it was interrupted by Velveteen Dream. Aleister Black and Dream began a story in which Dream wanted to be acknowledged. He wanted Black to say his name, but Black refused to. When we got to take over War Games, a simple Enjoy Infamy Velveteen Dream had the crowd going crazy. But that wasn't the only big story for Aleister Black. Black was laid out in the oh so dangerous NXT parking lot and there was a month long investigation as to who attacked him. There were so many people that it could have been but it was Gargano continuing his slow move to the dark side to get back at Champa. Asuka vs Ember Moon was one where Asuka knew that if she got hit with the Eclipse, it was game over so she resorted to underhanded tactics to pull out wins. Maybe two of the best non-title feuds for the women were those simple stories where your friend stabs you in the back. Dakota Kai vs Tegan Knox and Candice LeRae vs Io Shirai, simple to the point and they were enjoyable. It was also fun to see the competitive rivalries, the ones where it was basically about one-upsmanship like Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic or Samoa Joe and Finn Balor. And lastly, in 2021 came the final year of NXT Black and Gold, and it's almost perfect that this was NXT's last big feud. Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly for four years had been holding it down, and they were winning and winning and winning. They were on top of the world, but on Valentine's Day, Adam Cole broke everyone's heart, kicked Kyle O'Reilly right in the face, and he was sick and tired of him helping out Balor and not worrying about the Undisputed Era. This dude Adam Cole, when he turned heel, he went full psycho mode, destroying all his friends, kicking Roddy down low. At one point, the dude attacked Kyle O'Reilly so bad it had all of us believing that he had a legit seizure. They were trying to run each other down in parking lots, Cole went to O'Reilly's jiu-jitsu class, and the trilogy they had honestly deserved a crowd. It's sad, but also fitting that this was NXT's last big rivalry. They main evented Stan and Deliver with O'Reilly winning that match, and he'd eventually go on to also win this rivalry. How could I not talk about the cream of the crop? When I say NXT TakeOver, you probably think of a dark aesthetic which focused more on the in-ring work rather than the grand nature of everything else. Lights, camera, and in-ring work. From 2014 onwards, there was nothing better than a TakeOver. It almost became a parody of itself just how good it was. They reeled them off one after one, and the next one would seemingly be better than the previous. 
pulse pounding exhilarating high octane action which brought you out of your seat and into the match with a very high emphasis on in-ring work for the most part takeovers had a simple premise five matches on the card a women's match a tag team match a rivalry oriented match a showcase of two rising stars and then the nxt title match in the main event it was a formula which really took off in 2017. when they first started these shows were coming to us from full sail university the first one was simply known as nxt takeover then they named them based on the match type fatal four-way was the next one with an amazing fatal four-way main event makes complete sense our Evolution saw the debut of Kevin Owens and he ruined Sami Zayn's crowning moment. For their fifth special, they simply called it Takeover Rival. This is where tag team wrestling at Takeovers really took off. We got the big four horsewomen fatal four way, and Kevin Owens beat Sami Zayn so bad that he won the match by TKO. Takeover Unstoppable saw the debut of Samoa Joe. These early takeovers are so underappreciated. And I don't really know why. There's an organic magic to them, and it makes them fun to go back and rewatch. This is really the time frame which doesn't get its due. But what you guys are all waiting for are those crazy takeovers, where things went from good to great to pure insanity. 2015 saw the first ever takeover outside of Full Sail in Brooklyn, New York. Over the next four years, every summer NXT would return to New York and each year with a new cast of characters. The first ever Brooklyn takeover was critically acclaimed. The match that stole the show was Sasha Banks and Bayley. The near 20 minute epic saw both women go back and forth and slug things out with creative spots, close falls, and a rabid Brooklyn crowd behind them. It drew rave reviews and will forever be looked at as an artifact in women's wrestling. That first takeover outside of Full Sail was almost entirely fueled by that crazy Brooklyn crowd, and crazy crowds would become a theme as the years wore on. Bailey and Sasha Banks killed it, so much so that they had a rematch at the next one. At Takeover Respect, these two competed in the first ever Iron Woman match. Bailey took the win, and Sasha had an emotional goodbye. Three fourths of the four horsewomen had been called up to the main roster, with Bailey staying behind. It's insane to think that Sasha Banks was only 23 years old at this time. Respect also saw Samoa Joe and Finn Balor win the first ever Dusty Classic. They were building up to their slow rivalry. NXT TakeOvers were receiving critical acclaim from writers and those whose opinions mattered. Their superstars were starting to be known more even by the casual WWE fans. By the end of 2015, they made their way to London for the first TakeOver outside the US. But 2016 made this even bigger. Here's the run of elite and downright unforgettable takeovers that you've probably been waiting for me to talk about. It all began in Dallas, two nights before WrestleMania 32. Shinsuke Nakamura had signed with the WWE. The new guy was going to take on the heart and soul of NXT, and they did not disappoint. They went to war against each other. They had the crowd ooing and aahing over the tiniest thing. In the end, Nakamura won, and this was the goodbye to Sami Zayn in NXT. But again, as he left, a new generation took over. The show made huge waves because compared to WrestleMania 32, this one was seen as way better. Writers, reviewers, broadcasters were all praising the time and effort put into NXT's presentation. Takeover The End was presented as the final takeover at Full Sail, signaling a goodbye to the arena and hello to bigger venues. Toronto saw Mickey James return as well as a classic DIY revival match. But like most, every takeover had something. Takeover Chicago had Dunn and Bates steal the show with a fantastic NXT UK Championship match which began Dunn's 685 day reign. But at the end of 2017, they'd bring back an old concept which became a staple in NXT. They brought back War Games. Undisputed Era, Sanity, and AOP were just too much to contain, so TakeOver Houston became TakeOver War Games. It had everyone buzzing and this show didn't disappoint. Each year, the War Games match would somehow outdo the last. The event saw Andrade become the new NXT champion, now having the perfect mouthpiece by his side. Undisputed Era won an amazing War Games match, a fantastic culmination to the Velveteen Dream and Aleister Black rivalry. But in 2018, NXT took that notch of amazing takeovers and they cranked this thing to a, a thousand. These were about to become ridiculously insane shows. The year began with TakeOver Philadelphia. Philadelphia as we know is the home of Extreme and Adam Cole and Aleister Black did the Extreme Rules stipulation justice by just going out there and tearing each other into a pulp. 
but it was at the end of the night where we saw a match that would forever become a classic among NXT fans. Andrade versus Johnny Gargano for the NXT title. Gargano after being backstabbed was gonna fight for his dreams and he did that. For 32 minutes, he and Andrade put on a masterclass. The match became the first WWE match to receive a 5 star rating since 2011. Also on this show was announced the signing of War Machine, the signing of EC3, and the signing of Ricochet. NXT was about to go into complete overdrive. They were about to reach a level of in-ring superiority which many promotions could only pray for. At this point, takeovers were headed into parody territory. Next up came quite possibly the crown jewel of NXT TakeOvers, TakeOver New Orleans WrestleMania 34 weekend. As the brand grew in size, they announced a brand new mid-card championship, easily one of the most beautiful designs WWE has ever put out. The brand new North American Championship, and it would be contested in a ladder match. And let's just say, Things were off the chain in this pay-per-view. Ricochet was flying around everywhere. Killian Dane and Lars Sullivan were having a battle of power, just killing everyone in sight. Velveteen Dream was jumping off ladders. And then Adam Cole won it all and cemented his name in history, becoming the first ever NXT North American champion. This show was so integral in shaping the next generation of NXT. We had Roderick Strong join the Undisputed Era, giving them the tag team titles and the Dusty Classic win. Andrade and Black had an amazing match that very well could have main evented the show. Black won the title, but unfortunately his reign would take a backseat to Cole and Gargano. It was those same two that capped off the show in an unsanctioned match. This was arguably the most perfect variety show ever. Following this, Gargano and Champa continued their rivalry up until the fourth NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Yes, four, that's how many times they went there. Each match more violent and blood fueled than the last. Brooklyn 4 also saw an amazing North American title match between Cole and Ricochet, as well as a killer match between Mustache Mountain and Undisputed Era for the tag team titles. The Era competed in their second War Games match with the War Raiders who teamed up with Pete Dunne and Ricochet. I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but 2019 somehow was even better for the brand. NXT TakeOver Phoenix started off the year. Shayna Baszler continued her dominance against an emerging Bianca Belair. Gargano and Ricochet was great. Black and Champa main evented the show. So there was TakeOver New Orleans in 2018, and then in 2019, we got TakeOver New York. These are seen as the two best TakeOvers in NXT history. Unofficially, this was TakeOver Brooklyn 5 and it was insane. It started off with the farewell match for Aleister Black and Ricochet as they lost to the War Raiders, Velveteen Dream continued his rise as North American Champion, and then it was the showcase for the UK brand. Pete Dunne and Walter tore strips off each other. This match was amazing. Walter ended Dunne's 685 day reign. The main event saw the beginning of the trilogy that carried 2019 for NXT. Cole and Gargano. A 2 out of 3 falls match which was originally supposed to be the final battle between Gargano and Champa, with Gargano getting his crowning moment. Cole and Gargano had a match which was heavily reliant on false finishes. You could say it was a bit overdone, personally I think it was. At every point you'd think it was over and then someone would kick out until Gargano finally got his crowning moment. The brand celebrated its 25th takeover where Adam Cole became NXT champion and began the longest reign in NXT championship history. Takeover 25 also saw the Street Profits become NXT tag team champions in another classic ladder match. Takeover Toronto 2 saw a three stages of hell match between Cole and Gargano. This year for NXT was something truly special and following the move to USA, they just continued to chug along. War Games was great as always, and headed into 2020, we had quite possibly the greatest build to a TakeOver ever, and I'm talking about TakeOver Portland. Finn had turned heel, he was gonna face Gargano in the Battle of Generations. Kai and Knox had a nasty rivalry where Kai turned on her at War Games. Bianca and Rhea were on the rise. The Broserweights had formed an oddball tag team and won the Dusty Cup. They ended up beating the UE to become tag team champions. Two big beefy boys in Dominic Dijakovic and Keith Lee went out there, and as someone who was actually at TakeOver Portland, this match was something to marvel at. The spots they pulled off, the athleticism they showed, how hyped the crowd was, it was something truly special. Cole and Champa ended the night. Champa had returned from neck surgery and he'd gone from the hated villain to now the babyface trying to get back what he never lost. But this time it was Gargano who turned heel and we were headed for one final match between these two, the match that we didn't get the year previous. 
This was gonna happen at a show that's never happened called TakeOver Tampa Bay. The pandemic came in and NXT, like many, continued to move forward. They revived old concepts. They brought back In Your House, which was a decent event. It saw a backlog brawl between Cole and Dream for the NXT title. And the night ended with Io Shirai beating both Charlotte and Rhea Ripley to become the new NXT Women's Champion. To this day, Charlotte winning at WrestleMania 36 has to be one of the most nonsensical booking decisions ever. It literally helped no one. TakeOver 30 was another show which felt like a change in NXT. Cole was no longer champion. He faced Pat McAfee in a really fun match. Io Shirai continued her strong list of matches facing and beating Dakota Kai. An amazing North American Championship ladder match saw Damian Priest rise up the card. And to end the night, Karrion Cross became the new NXT champion. This dude had came in and wreaked havoc, man, literally squashed one of the faces of NXT in minutes. 31 was yet again great. Kyle O'Reilly and Finn Balor as the main event was a much different style than the work rate we were used to. I really liked it, I thought it was great. War Games was again great. And then we came to 2021 where it was Vengeance Day. MSK came in and quickly became the team to beat. Finn Balor and Pete Dunne had a match which was long overdue. Balor was now in his second reign as NXT Champion, but that night saw the end of Undisputed Era. And the end of Takeovers was coming too. But before that, we had the first two night takeover. See, at this point, the roster had become so ridiculously good that there were so many people on there that wouldn't have made a normal takeover card. So they needed to split this up into two nights. And it was fantastic, arguably the last true NXT takeover. Walter and Champa had a match of the year contender beating each other into a pulp. MSK, Legato, and GYV did what tag teams in NXT always do, they tore the house down. Raquel won the NXT Women's Championship off Io Shirai. Nice. Cross beat Balor on night two, and the show ended with Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole in an unsanctioned match. It was basically a copy of Champa and Gargano from years ago. I'll get into this in a bit, but following Stand and Deliver, things got really messy. NXT's consistency wasn't there. The women's title wasn't a focus anymore. Cross as NXT champion didn't hit like many thought it would. Sure, there were some bright spots, but ask a majority of people who followed the NXT product, and they'll tell you that post Stand and Deliver, it was a strange dynamic. Once the brand moved to Tuesdays, things were just kind of there. Following this, there would be two more takeovers, In Your House and 36, which would prove to be the final one as of the recording of this video. NXT also had their fair share of TV matches and specials as well. Super Tuesday, Halftime Heat, The Great American Bash, a quick nod over to NXT UK, which is unfortunately no longer a thing, Bait vs. Dunn, Walter vs. Dunn, Bait vs. Walter, Dragonov vs. Walter. The match quality they had was insane. But now we move into our final chapters, and we gotta backtrack for a second. By 2019, NXT had become the show for the hardcore viewer. Also in that year, we saw the debut of All Elite Wrestling, which would air live on Wednesday nights. NXT decided to also move their show to Wednesday on the USA Network to combat AEW. They would stack up their cards, and the fall of 2019 till about when the pandemic hit, NXT was amazing. They were firing on all cylinders. Every Wednesday, you would go in, and there would never be a bad show. It was a fun show to watch, it was now 2 hours long and they didn't really lose their identity, but moving to TV definitely made them add a lot more to shows, something that wasn't always needed. The 2 hour telecast they went all out for every single week. WWE wanted to present them as their official third brand and not a developmental, to the point where they added them into Survivor Series. They invaded Raw and SmackDown and they gave us some memorable episodes. WWE, in effort to drive up viewership, had main roster stars go down to NXT, which gave us some pretty cool confrontations and one match in particular that I always throw on every now and then between Undisputed Era and The Revival. NXT won Survivor Series and all eyes were on them. They were built up as THE brand and for a period of time, they were doing just fine. They brought back Finn Balor. Their roster, in my opinion, was the best that it will ever see. Dijakovic, Walter, Lee, Ripley, Belair, Shirai, Baszler, UE, Riddle, the list goes on. But once the pandemic hit, NXT started to suffer and it seemed directionless. We still had great matches, 
but it didn't feel the same once they ended their partnership with Full Sail and they went to the PC. The show by 2021 had a new cast of characters, LA Knight, Cameron Grimes, Legato, Imperium meshed with the old guard, but post Stand and Deliver, like I mentioned, the women's title, not a focus. They didn't have that one big main event championship match. Cross didn't hit the way a lot of people thought he would. What was branded as the Wednesday night war between AEW and NXT saw NXT lose. They'd eventually move away from the Wednesday spot back to Tuesdays. NXT on Tuesdays was not the same. They seemed creatively stifled with a lot of people dipping in and out of rivalries. And remember how I started this video talking about a defined start and end point? They didn't seem to have it in this case. Not to say it was bad, they just tried to cram a lot into their show. Like O'Reilly and Cole being the final big NXT rivalry, it's fitting that the champion at this time was Karrion Cross. The dude says the end is near. Well, the end was in fact here. By the end of August, a returning Samoa Joe was your new NXT champion for the third time in his career. It felt like old times, maybe the full sale return was coming. In no time, takeovers were going to be back on the road with fans screaming their lungs out. But old times weren't going to last. This was the end of the black and gold NXT. A report came out saying that WWE wanted to take a different direction with the product. They wanted to go back to their roots on developing talent with hopes of making stars who could one day main event WrestleMania. September 7th, 2021 marked the final black and gold NXT up until the recording of this video. WWE released a slew of wrestlers who had been champions and staples of the brand. They killed off the original NXT which people held dearly to their heart at war games and it was out with the old guard. Fans were frustrated at WWE seemingly killing the only thing that mattered to them. Everything we talked about was now just a memory. They got rid of takeovers. They fell into the same tendencies of the main roster which was originally what separated them. They had an emphasis on crazy and ridiculousness rather than the straightforward and simple. NXT Black and Gold was dead. NXT at its peak became something special, something that no one could have ever fathomed. In 2012, when that first episode aired, who would have thought that something intended to be a show for the next generation would reach the popularity of WWE's main offering? NXT built themselves a legacy which, let's be honest, they probably wouldn't be able to equate to. Why? Because it wasn't forced. This was something that trended upwards for 5 or 6 years, and then the 2 or 3 years they were at the top, they stayed at the top. It became laughable the amount of talent they had. They just couldn't go back to their roots anymore. They had to cater to this new fan base that they had built. It's so hard in what we watch to capture the imagination of so many, but NXT Black and Gold did that. They knew who this product was for. It was almost like, oh, you're disenfranchised with the WWE? Come over here, give our product a try, and we promise you're gonna like it. To this day, people love that brand. People love the stars of the brand. They'll follow them wherever they go. It's amazing what the logo on your screen represents. It represents nearly a decade where stars would come and go, but at the end of the day, the one thing that never left was the desire to give you a product that was different. A product that you could always rely on. It was truly remarkable. It was able to capture the entire wrestling world and bring people from all over the place together. This version was truly not your kind and it left behind a legacy that will forever be looked at for years to come. Three letters, one fan base, an amazing legacy, N-X-T.